Welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast. I'm joined, of course, by the chompinest chompy chomper, Amy Hollenkamp, RD. I had to try to keep it in theme with what we're talking about today, right? That that was the goal, at least. So mm. probably confused the listeners, confused you. Uh, I'm Nikki. Again, I'm trying to get better about introducing myself so you know who's talking to you. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that we have little to no expertise in. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk about it anyway. <laughs> we're going to talk about it anyway. Well, I feel like we have enough expertise in like the body and the microbiome and the digestive tube that we could definitely inform the dear people at home about this topic. We but know I'm just enough saying, we're not to potentially dentists. be helpful. Or dangerous. One or the other? One right. The other. Right. You, want, you I mean, decide. Yeah. Cast your vote in the YouTube comments down below. Right. Not yet, though, because you haven't listened to the episode. Uh, I know that people clicked on the episode so they know what the title is, but would you like to tell them the topic that we're talking about and maybe lead us off? Oh, look at this shout out. I'm boring her. I'm boring. No, I'm sorry I, I bore young, you so much, Amy. I have a young child who still ha is not sleeping through the night. Um, Waiters but, making proof it's not excuses. Okay, yes, you're correct. I hope that everybody knows I'm joking, but they're, they're going to start this episode and think I'm the most terrible person on planet earth at the rate I'm going. So I'm just going to clam up and let you talk. Oh my God. Well, so when it comes to what we're talking about today, we're going to be talking about dental stuff and just oral health, I should say, oral health in general, how it affects, could affect your microbiome, how it could affect overall inflammation in the body. Um, and yeah, all the, all that jazz. I feel like we're going to just kind of dive a little bit into like how to take care of your oral microbiome and your oral health so that it's going to set you up for more success from like a gut standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And I think an overall body standpoint too, it's yeah. yet again, conventional medicine and like the system that we have, right? It it tends to break you up into bits and then you go to the specialist for whatever bit is ailing you. So if you have a heart problem, you go to the cardio, uh, the cardiologist. If you have a GI problem, you go to the GI doctor. If you have a hormone problem, you go to the endocrinologist. And if you have a mouth problem, you go to the dentist, but that's right. Not exactly how the body works, right? Like all the parts affect the other parts and oral health and like dental health, that's no exception to that rule. Um, so I thought it was worth making mention of again, neither of us are dentists or oral hygienists or have any formal training in this. But we know about the health of the human body. And we know some of the ways it's connected. I will share right off the get go, though, if any of you know, a super legit, holistic or functional dentist, who knows about the oral microbiome in particular, we would love to do a full interview on this topic on the podcast. I've tried to reach out to the guy over at Ask the Dentist on Instagram, and he hasn't ever responded to me. So, you know, I've, I've tried him. I don't know if there's anybody else who has a lot of expertise. But if you know of anybody, maybe like a smaller fish in the pond, so to speak, if you want to leave that in the YouTube comments on this video, maybe I can reach out to somebody, we could have a really good conversation about this. But um, I think the two things that I want to mostly focus on for this episode are inflammation that starts in the mouth can affect your inflammation burden body wide. I think that's really important to understand. And that includes but is not limited to the gut. And also, if you think about the GI tract as one continuous tube, the beginning of the tube is the mouth. And then the food travels down the esophagus, then the stomach, then the small bowel, then the colon, then the rectum and out the anus. So really, you are one continuous tube or straw from mouth to anus. So theoretically, the stuff that's happening at the beginning of the tube has a, the potential to affect the stuff further downstream. We talked about this in the digestion north to south episodes, right? We talked about how chewing and enzymes and stomach acid affect things further down in the small intestine and the colon. So I don't think that the mouth is any exception to that, wouldn't you say? 
Yeah, 100%. I think I think we tend to separate a lot of the microbiomes, but like the mouth in particular because it's feeding into the gut <laughs> microbiome is certainly going to be a bigger pun feeding in, pun into? not intended. I know pun was not intended, but good catch. But yeah, so the the oral microbiome is definitely going to feed into it. And I know we might have talked about this. I don't know if we talked about this with S Sarah Hornsby, the myofunctional lady that we had on. But like, it's interesting because again, like obviously what you're eating is going to affect your like oral microbiome. I know like, again, like if you're eating a lot of sugar, it's going to like lead to more um, bugs that you don't, that lead to cavities. I, I can't remember what that specific bug is that leads to cavities. Oh man, we are, we are dropping it low on this podcast. Nikki is, her desk is moving down. Um, resisting the urge to sing, get low, get low. Yeah. Um, no. I was just being a goof on the video. I didn't necessarily intend to interrupt you for the eighth time this episode. Continue, my darling, continue. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, like, your diet's going to affect your oral microbiome a lot. So if you're, again, like, drinking sodas or eating a lot of, like, candy, like, sugar in particular, I think is going to be the most problematic for your oral microbiome and as well as your, like, gut microbiome, too, because you're probably getting less fibers and, like, nutrients that are going to keep it healthy. But then I also think, like, sometimes mouth breathing, like, I know the myofunctional space talks a lot about this, like just the simple fact of the environment you're creating, if you tend to breathe through your mouth, even like at night, can create changes in the microbiome that you don't necessarily want. Because a lot of bugs, you want primarily the bugs that don't need a lot of oxygen in your mouth, or, or at least that's what I recall. Particularly like if you're breathing through your mouth, it creates a totally different environment, which can make certain bugs grow and other bugs not grow and it's more optimal to to breathe through your nose versus your mouth so if you tend to breathe through your mouth a lot more or if you're like mouth breathing at night it could really cause more disruption in in your healthy oral microbiome so yeah like those two things are something to consider it's always un interesting too because like um you know the the main thing, like when you go to the dentist, is they're trying to prevent cavities, but you don't really hear as much about like the gums being really important. Um, and like again, like gum disease from an inflammation standpoint, like if your gums aren't healthy because again there's bacteria that are kind of like busting through the gum lining into your bloodstream, it can cause a lot of inflammation. I remember when I went to like my more holistic dentist, that was something that he covered really thoroughly. Like he won't even work on people whose gums are bleeding a ton, like when they're doing a cleaning. Um, so like before you can even go get your teeth cleaned, he makes you do like all this work on your gums so that when they do the cleaning, it's not like busting your gums all up, like, you know, making you bleed. Because if you're someone that does bleed a lot during cleanings, it could be that your gums are more, in, more inflamed. Um, you could even have some nutrient deficiencies too that might be leading to that. But I think most of the time it's because people have slightly more inflamed gums. Um, and again, if your gums are inflamed and that or the microbiome's getting into your uh, bloodstream, that's where it can lead to like more systemic type inflammation. But yeah, I always thought that was really interesting. My dentist was like, no, no, no. Like I'm going to come educate you about gum disease and then like really emphasize it. And then you come back and then you do the cleaning. Like he looks at all your gums and like how much gum loss you have too, like in the initial appointment. Like it's kind of like similar in some ways to like how when we meet with a client, we're like trying to assess like where they're at with their gut health. He's trying to assess like the health of my gums. Like based are on like your how much gums healthy enough for you to get a cleaning? Right. Right. 
Yeah. So again, like he assesses that. He assesses like how much loss is at each gum. He assesses if you're grinding, which can also affect your health in a number of ways too. So like sometimes when you see, he says too, you can see like the pattern of the gum loss can look different with someone that's grinding versus someone that's like has like bacteria that's kind of Mm. eating away too so like it can the patterns can look a little bit different i guess because he would be like oh you have like a really clear grinding pattern with like how your gums look on this side um so yeah it was just kind of interesting it's very thorough but like i had never been to a dentist where they like heavily focused on gum health Uh, it was all just like oh well you don't have cavity and like cavity and gum health can go together um because I think the bacteria that can cause cavities also is going to be what's going to inflame the gums. So, again, I thought it was just, like, really, really interesting. Um, some of the stuff that he had me doing was, like, way more focused on just, like, keeping the gums healthy, making sure you're flossing, that kind of thing. But you don't see that super often, I think, in the regular dental space. Yeah, I, I think that it's hit and miss maybe. And honestly, this could be a screening tool of sorts to judge if your new dentist is super legit, sort of legit or not legit. Right. Right. Um, And by that, I mean, if you so uh, I'll pose a picture. Our last dentist, uh, before we moved out of Chapel Hill, I thought was great. He wasn't necessarily holistic, necessarily, but they did the pokey pokey like pocket depth test, Mm -hmm. um, at least once a year, if not every appointment. And he, you know, they talked about gum health at least a bit. And he would, you know, pull your tongue out and look for oral cancer. And he would palpate lymph nodes and palpate the thyroid every single time. And I was like, man, yes, yes, get it head and neck doctor. Like I'm all for right. Dentists embracing the rest of the head and the neck and screening for this sort of stuff. So I thought he was really good. Our current guy is holistic. That's how I found him. When we moved towns, I found this guy. Um, right. And he, he looks for oral cancers and moves the tongue all around. He doesn't palpate the neck. So that's a teeny bit of a bummer. Um, I was impressed by the guy who did that for every appointment. Um, but, you know, they, they talk about gum health and flossing and, and stuff of moderate amount. So I think that they're pretty darn legit. And they also, the way that I found this guy actually was I Google searched something called Myobrace. Um, Myobrace mm. is this like dental device uh, retainery looking thing that you wear, or it's an oral appliance that you wear at night and you wear a little bit during the day and it helps widen the palate very gently. And the idea, right. particularly with children, is that if you do this, it helps with the development of the airway and it can help prevent the need for braces, potentially. Um, I learned about that on a podcast talking about oral health and mouth breathing and whatnot. Um, so I actually, I did a, like a Google map search for Myobrace and I found this guy side note. I found out, um, if there's ever a service or a product that you want and you want to find like a doctor or an office that carries that particular thing, they will oftentimes have like a doctor locator on their website and you can use that, but you might also want to pop it into a Google map search because what I found out with Myobrace is that uh, because I found them on Google, but I looked and they're not listed on the Myobrace practitioner directory. And I asked, hey, what's the dealio? And they said, basically, the company charges a lot of money to be listed in their directory. And so they have like all the certifications, they do Myobrace, they have all the stuff, but they just chose to not list it on that directory because it was some outrageous price. So anyway, side note, uh, though that may be, Um, I found him because of that, because they are at least somewhat aware and mindful of airway health and, you know, development of the airway and the palate. 
Uh, so we're probably going to do that with Jess at some point in the next year or so is get her started on that because she does have some crowding. Um, but anyway, where, where was I going with this? Oh, gum health. Yeah, so gum health is a really good indicator light for you to know if you have oral dysbiosis. And I forget if I learned this from a dentist or like a functional medicine class. But I've, I've heard before that if you have gingivitis, or if you have unhealthy gums, that's 100% slam dunk, you have oral dysbiosis. So you could mm. look at it that way to some degree. Like if you have gingivitis, or another way to put it, you wouldn't get gingivitis in the absence of dysbiosis. So mm. that's a way to look at it, perhaps. Um, obviously, not over consuming sugar and really refined carbohydrates too. I know the ask the dentist guy on Instagram, like he posts about goldfish crackers being the worst thing for children's teeth, because those starches, those processed starches get really sticky. And they stick to your teeth, you know, you know, like we've all been eating a cracker or a potato chip or a piece of junk food and like a little chunk of it gets kind of just matted to the top of your tooth in the nooks and crannies. And, and it probably sits there for a few hours. And things like goldfish crackers are pretty bad for that, apparently. So don't over consume a lot of highly processed simple carbohydrates, and certainly sugar. That's got to be step one, I would also throw out that any sort of tobacco usage or smoking is pretty terrible for oral health purposes. So whether it's smoking um, cigarettes or or illicit drugs or vaping or what you know there's there's certainly with cigarettes and chewing tobacco there's very very well documented evidence that that is bad for your oral health and your gums and it can lead to head and neck right. and mouth and throat cancers so that's another pretty foundational one. If you're going to pick two things to focus on, I would say brush and floss every single day. Uh, if you don't want to, simple advice is suck it up, you baby, and just do it. And number two is don't smoke or use tobacco products. And that's at least a good starting point to go off of. Yeah, it's really interesting. At one, So my... My sister's a dentist. She's a pediatric dentist. And then my other sister's in dental school. And one thing she always says, too, is, like, if you're going to eat sugar, try to do it with a meal, too. She said, like, sometimes just eating sugar, like, throughout the day, like, if you pop a hard candy in your mouth or something and you do that often, like, if you're getting that sugar by itself away from meals, like, and you don't have that saliva and, like, other stuff that was in there with it. I don't know all the ins and outs, but she's always saying like, definitely, if you're going to do sugar, eat it with a meal and not away from a meal. Because again, like it's, there needs to be some space and time. Again, I can't remember all the, the logistics of it, but I know yeah, there like was have it as a dessert again, she's instead bit of adamant snack. on that. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I think so. Yeah. Have it as dessert, not a snack. And if you think about it too, that's just good health advice anyway, because we know that that's going to blunt mm, yeah. any sort of blood sugar response. So if you eat a piece of cake or a cookie or ice cream or whatever, all by itself, you're probably going to get a pretty significant blood glucose swing, and then maybe a crash down later on. But if you have it after you had you know, a nice well rounded meal, and you had fat and protein and fiber to slow down that carbohydrate absorption, you're not going to get nearly as bad of a blood sugar response from that sugar. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. I think that's a good point. Some too. other thing too, like, my sister would say, you know, this was like back when I lived with her, because we both went to UK, and I was kind of an undergrad, and I was a second year undergrad when she was a second year dental student or whatever when I went to UK. So we were kind of on the same track, but she was in like a professional school and I was an undergrad. But she would, I remember one discussion we had was she was basically saying that like flossing in her mind, like if you had to pick brushing or flossing, she thinks flossing is more important. Like that's kind of what they were learning in school. Like the actual getting the the bacteria like out of the crevices, like out of the, I can't, here's me trying to discuss dentist, dentistry when I'm not a dentist. But like, I just remember her saying like, you know, 
probably flossing might even be more important than brushing um, from like a prevention of cavity standpoint, from like an overall health gum health standpoint, which I thought was so interesting because I feel like that's the thing that most people aren't doing. Like most people are like better at brushing than I think flossing. Um, but yeah, I think like don't skip the flossing. If you're someone too that has a decent amount of gum issues like I did this like when I was prepping for my initial appointment with my dentist but I don't do it at this point I just do regular floss but like water picking especially if you're someone that has like significant gingivitis um or a lot of again like uh, inflammation of the gums like can be really helpful um apparently again like the water pick can blow out debris that sometimes flossing can't get to. Um, and again, like it's just kind of massages the gums in a nice way. Um, so again, like they're big with water picks at my dental office. Uh, I don't think everybody needs one, but I think again, if you have, go ahead. Oh, I was trying to not interrupt you. Um, I will throw out there though. So I was using, uh, so I had one of those retainer bars behind my front teeth on the top mm-hmm. and bottom up until about a year ago. And it's such a pain in the butt to floss. So I didn't. So I had a water pick and um, I was still getting a pretty good amount of buildup behind those teeth. And, you know, when I was explaining, cause they ask you, do you floss? And I would just say, yes. And then sometimes right. I would say like, Oh, and I have a water pick. And when we got talking about it and I revealed that I only really water pick the front and I use regular floss on the back teeth, my dentist right. and oral hygienist both said, no, 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 no. The water pick is good for dislodging debris. But part right. of why flossing is great is because you can like scrape the side of the tooth mm-hmm. and water picking can't do that. So they said, if right. you want a water pick, you would want to do that in addition to regular flossing. Right. Um, or like if you have some tough to reach areas, maybe you could do that on occasion or like if you have braces. Um, but yeah, they were pretty adamant that you want to do that in addition to regular flossing. And at that point I was like, oh, if I'm going to expend the energy to do regular flossing, I might as well just only do the flossing. So I, I ditched it, but I do think you're right. I think that it'll massage the gums and maybe blow out some of the crud from the little pockets down in like the nooks and crannies right. of the gums. So that could be really good for somebody yeah, who's struggling again, with like, inflamed gums. Right, right. I think again, like I probably wouldn't do it unless I felt like I was like getting gingivitis or it was interesting. I, I probably should have done it when I was pregnant because my gums were like insanely bloody when I was pregnant. And it was like, whoa. I think some of the hormonal changes cause it. My dentists were saying like, it's really common for bleeding gums during pregnancy. Mm. Had no idea, but it stopped like right when I was done. Well, it's, it like revved up at different points in the pregnancy. So it's very weird. Interesting. Yeah. But, I um, what that was about, yeah, I probably should have done it during that time, but I didn't. Cause I was like, ah, oh, another thing to worry about. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think again, like it, like I said, I think it could be more helpful if you're more inflamed and have gingivitis. Another thing too, um, good old fashioned warm water with salt and swishing that around as a rinse a couple times a day. I know every now and then I will have some acutely irritated gums. It's usually, you know, like I ate a potato chip and one of the stabby parts poked me in the gums and now my gums are all pissy. Right. Or I have one of the retainers that's kind of like Invisalign, but it's not Invisalign. So sometimes I wonder if mm-hmm. that like gets caught funny or something and my gums get mad at me. Um, and whenever that happens, my usual go-to at least for a day or two is a, I don't use the Invisalign retainer that night. Right. Cause I, I give them a break and I don't want to irritate them. Um, but all, and I refrain from like, chips and stuff that would poke them further, but right. I'll do a warm right. salt water rinse and just swish that in my mouth for a few minutes and spit it out and do that a few times a day. And it does really help if, if the problem persists beyond maybe a day or two, I have also been known to bust out my bottle of black seed oil 
uh, which is AKA black cumin seed oil. But if you read about that stuff, it's wicked cool. Like anti-inflammatory, antihistamine, antibacterial, anti-candida, anti-parasitic, antiviral, anti-everything. The running gag is that it can cure everything but death. <laughs> Honest to God. And, you know, at that point, I, if it's persisting more than a day or two, the irritation, I start wondering like, oh, okay, maybe I have a little bit of like a pocket of dysbiosis or the inflammation is just kind of getting carried away and I need to tamp it down a bit. So either way, the black seed oil should theoretically work. And for all that it doesn't taste great, it does seem to work. And I'll kind of do the oil pulling basically and, and like swish that around in my mouth and pull it through the teeth and do that for 10 or 15 minutes and do that maybe once or twice a day. And that usually will resolve the issue again, like if it's more persistent than normal, I maybe do that once a year, if that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, what about this? I, I'm curious again, I don't, I remember when this study came out to, it was like, pfft. do you remember that study that was like, if you use mouthwash twice a day or something, that it increases your risk of diabe diabetes? D did you ever read that study? I don't think I did. I know I've seen that guy that Mark whatever his last name is, ask the dentist on Instagram. Or I know Hemi, I've seen him posting Hemi. that if you use mouthwash, it, the idea I think is that mouthwash is equivalent to an antibiotic and it's just wiping out all right. of the flora and it's way too aggressive. Right. And I know that he's posted some research that there's an increased risk of, I think heart attack as well, like heart disease Could might be. also be linked with this. And he was saying that maybe one of the mechanisms is that um, using mouthwash decreases nitric oxide. Uh, nitric oxide is an mm. antioxidant system that's important for dilating your blood vessels and blood vessel health, among other things. So yeah, I kind of know of, right. of some of that, but I didn't know about the diabetes one. Yeah, I pulled it up. Um, it says... People that use mouthwash twice daily or more at baseline had approximately 50% increased risk of developing prediabetes or diabetes combined compared to those who use mouthwash less than twice a day or not at all. Um, yeah. Again, I don't know all the ins and outs of that study. I just remember when it came out, people were like, oh my God. Like I remember it being shared a bunch. And I think it's like, it's what you said. Very interesting. Like you don't want to nuke your oral microbiome, just like you want to avoid nuking your yeah. um, gut microbiome too. It definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, it makes me think of a Mitch Hedberg joke. Uh, side note, favorite comedian of all time. And uh, he has a bit where he's talking about like using Listerine and he says, germs do not go quietly. And he's talking about how yeah. like it stings and it burns so much, but he says germs do not go quietly right. and I crack up. Um, but yeah, it's, we don't need it. Um, every now and then I will splurge and get like a hippy dippy natural mouthwash just to get that minty fresh feeling, but it's a lot more gentle. Right. It doesn't sting. Um, but and it's like wintergreen flavor or something, but I don't do that a whole lot. Um, but yeah, I think same general principles apply. You don't want to obliterate everything in your mouth, just like you wouldn't want to obliterate everything in your colon or your small bowel. Well, the people we're talking to right now, they might want to obliterate everything in their small bowel. Who am I kidding? But uh, you shouldn't. That should not be the goal. Right. I also kind of wonder, I wonder yeah. if using mouthwash increases the risk of thrush and like oral candidiasis. Mm, yeah. Right? Because if you're killing all the bacteria all the time, then maybe maybe those are the people who take an antibiotic for the sniffles and then whammo, they get oral thrush. Somebody right. should research this. Right. Right. I know. I know. Ugh. I know. I think that, like, again, the oral thrush scenario is so interesting. Like, because, again, like, usually it comes post-antibiotics, 
Now, again, like a lot of times you're just like swallowing a pill and it can be systemic too. So it could affect the oral microbiome um, because again, it's just going to affect the whole body in the balance of different microbes in the whole body. But yeah, it's like you wonder because the mouthwash does a similar type thing. If yeah. it can lead to kind of, it could probably make you more susceptible to thrush for sure. I, can, I, I would think so. I think that's a good theory. It just follows yeah. logical sense. So I feel like that could be a thing. Um, here's another thought too. You know how with the gut microbiome, we talk about how 70% of your immune system lives in your gut. And therefore, the microbiome in and around the intestines, those microbes are continually educating and stimulating your immune system, and they're molding your immune system, right? Well, right. you also have a ton of immune cells hanging around the, the mouth and the throat. What do you think tonsils and adenoids are? And lymph nodes, they're just giant lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. And lymph nodes are like frat houses for white blood cells. And you have a ton of lymph nodes in the head and neck. I forget, we mm -hmm. had to know all of them right. for a physical exam class. I forget, there's like, if you count like bilaterally, left and right, I think there's like 22 palpatable lymph nodes in the head and right. neck area. We only ever talk about the ones right here under the corner of the jaw, but there's a lot more. And they are probably, it, it, they and the immune system cells that live in them are probably influenced very much by the oral microbiome and its health and oral health in general. Um, but I know, I, I haven't heard this with a human necessarily, but I know a friend of mine w wanted to take her dog in for a dental cleaning. And you know, they like, they put the dog under anesthesia and they right. do the cleaning. So it's kind of a it's super surgical expensive procedure. Did you know that? It's it like, is. It's like wicked expensive. Yeah. But um, she wanted to take her dog in for a dental cleaning. Like the, the vet said that she needed it. Right. She was due. And they actually would not schedule her for the longest time because the dog's white blood count was too low. And she had this continual issue Dang. for a year or two where her neutrophils, her white, her, the big part of her white count was too low and they kept retesting and retesting. Well, they later switched both of their dogs to a raw diet and transitioned to feeding them raw vegetables and raw meat. And I think they maybe put them on a couple of doggy supplements, maybe like an omega-3 and a doggy probiotic or something few months later. Oh, I think they might have also done some dog acupuncture also. Um, anyway, cut to, you know, six months goes by of doing all these changes. And ever since then, her white count has been perfect. Mm. And then she was able to get a dental cleaning. But it makes you wonder right. too, you know, so I think that the concern is if you get a cleaning or if you have more extreme dental work done, certainly, there's going to be some bacteria that's dislodged, and it can make it into the bloodstream. Like that's right. a known thing that happens. That's why they prescribe antibiotics a lot of time when you have like a tooth removed or a root canal, because they want to get ahead of that and prevent that from happening. And, and as a side note, we mentioned this in a recent episode on antibiotics, but if a dentist recommends antibiotics, please take them. It's too risky and weird stuff can happen if like the bacteria from your mouth makes it to your heart and shacks up on one of your valves. Um, it's just, it's too risky right. when that sort of stuff is known to happen. So I would just suck it up and take the antibiotics if a dentist recommends them. Um, but I think it, it's probably in line with that knowledge that some of the bacteria can get dislodged and they wind up in your bloodstream. And then some of them can shack up in other tissues you want your immune system to be super healthy and strong and able to fight infection. So if there's a bacteria right. or two or three swimming around in your bloodstream, the resident immune cells can attack them and kill them before they get a chance to shack up in weird locations like the valves of your heart. So um, there's a little bit of interplay too. I think that the mouth and oral health influences immune function. But also, right. 
you need a healthy immune system to deal with any microbes, particularly if you get a dental cleaning or certainly more aggressive dental work. Right, right. No, it's a good point. It's a good point. Um, yeah. One thing we haven't talked about too is like we talked a little bit about mouth breathing, sometimes mouth taping in the evenings, or like I should say, not in the evenings when you're wanting to talk, but when you're going to bed. So mouth taping is so weird. It's like a weird thing to bring up with clients, I find, where it's like, uh, don't freak out. But like, I'm going to send you a little information about mouth taping. You can kind of take a look at it and decide if you want to do it or not. But there is like, I know there's a brand, it's called Somnifix too, that it's more expensive. I usually say like, if you haven't done it before, use that brand just to get you started. So it's like less freaky. Um, uh Oh, Oh God. Nikki's mouth is taped so she can't Demo. talk. Yeah. I, keep, but I keep a roll of tape, like the white medical tape, the paper tape. I keep a roll of this in my drawer at my desk so that if I talk to somebody about this, I could do a little demo and show them. Oh, cool. Um, there's also, there are a couple of good videos on mouth taping on the High Intensity Health YouTube channel. Um, as a side note, his earlier material, Mike Mutzel, excellent, so good. Uh, his channel definitely took a distinct turn to mostly talking about like anti-COVID, anti-vax stuff since 2020. So if you look at his channel and you're like, oh, cringe, it look at his earlier stuff. It was really excellent. Some of his new stuff is okay too, but just FYI, his channel has changed pretty drastically in the last three years. Um, but he's got some videos talking about mouth taping and actually he interviewed the ask a dentist guy. That's how I learned about him mm -hmm. was on Mike Mutzel's podcast, high intensity health. And right. that's where I learned about myo brace and mouth taping, but he has some shorter videos also. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how much it's helped him. So sometimes I'll, sh I'll send people those little videos to learn more, but I do warn people that he in the videos uses a truly ridiculous amount of tape. It's, uh, he does like, f like three or four pieces vertically right. and then like one piece horizontally up top <laughs> one piece horizontally down below it, it's bonkers how much tape right. he uses usually particularly right. for women and we don't have a lot of facial hair typically one or maybe two vertical strips will do the trick or you could do right. one just across the lips usually i have people right. try it with the cheapo white paper tape the medical tape first okay. right and then right you know, after a few weeks, if you get the hang of it, and if you think it's really helping you, then you can graduate to like the Somnifix or the fancy tapes that are designed for this purpose. See, it's yeah. funny. I usually do the opposite because I feel like the Somnifix are more comfortable. Hmm. Have you ever used the Somnifix the ones? Way to go about it. I well, haven't. There's no, probably no tried, correct I, method. Yeah. See, in my oh. mind, see, you're prioritizing comfort. I'm prioritizing cheapness. Because <laughs> you can right. get a roll That's of paper true. tape for like four bucks at any pharmacy. Right. The hypo and most people and have the it in their fix one is like, yeah, yeah. It's like a yeah. dollar per strip, I think, or something in that rough ballpark, maybe 75 cents per strip. So it's definitely a bit more of a financial commitment. Um, oh, 100%. Yes. But yeah, I never tried Somnifix because I did mouth taping with the paper tape for about a week or so. Right. Thinking, oh, I have all of the symptoms <laughs> you would think, right, from the episode with, um, oh my God, I feel rude. What's her name? I could picture Sarah her face. Hornsby. Thank you. With Sarah Hornsby. Side note, episode 67. If you want to learn more, I only know that off the top of my head because I had a dental cleaning this morning and I just told the oral hygienist to check out that episode. So oh. I, I don't have that memorized normally, but it's episode 67 where we talk with the myofunctional therapist about airway and, and tongue ties and mouth breathing. Um, but, uh, right. shoot, I got sidetracked because I was so embarrassed that I didn't remember her name. Um, Oh, when we talked with her in that interview, 
we were talking about the people who have more of a tendency to mouth breathe, like, oh, super, super narrow mm. palates and narrow airway, ear infection kid, sinusitis person, right? nasal, you know, congestion sort of stuff. And like everything she talked about, I was ticking it off the list, like, damn, damn, damn. Right. Okay, this is me, clearly. This is me. And, right. uh, and funny enough, through through my own experimentation and trying mouth taping years ago, I actually don't think I mouth breathe. I don't mouth breathe at all during the day. Yeah. And I really don't think I do at night either. Um, mm. Like I sometimes I'll ask people like in my intake paperwork, I ask people, here are the telltale signs. You ready? I ask people, do you snore? If you say yes, that's yeah. automatic mouth breathing. Right, because you can't really snore with your mouth closed. You could try, but it won't work very well. Um, so snoring, that's a dead ringer. You know your mouth breathing if you snore. Uh, the other ones I ask are, do you wake up with a dry mouth? Because again, it was gaping open and catching flies all night. Uh, do you wake up in the night and like you need to drink water throughout the night and first thing in the morning? That's a roundabout way of asking, do you have a dry mouth? So sometimes that can be an indication. Um, And I ask, do you wake up with a stuffy nose that was not stuffy when you first went to bed? And if that happens consistently, and it's not a, oh, I have a cold now sort of a thing. If it happens consistently where throughout the day and at night you go to bed and your nose is totally clear, but then you wake up and your nose is totally stuffed. That's also an indication that you're breathing through your mouth at night. So when somebody answers, you know, more than one of those things affirmatively, I usually recommend that they at least try mouth tape, try it for like a week and see what happens. But yeah, I don't think I mouth breathe because I don't have any of those um, symptoms, if you will. But it's funny because like based off of my medical history, you would think I'd be a huge mouth breather. But yeah, I don't know. The only other additional thing I might add is that... um, Sometimes grinding, like if you know you're a grinder, there's something, I think it's called upper airway resistance syndrome that they kind of like, it's usually in people that are like, I don't know, this is how I remember it being described. Sometimes it's in like women that are of tinier builds. Um, I don't know why that matters, but I feel like I remember specifically them talking about like that tends to be like the characteristic is like kind of trimmer, maybe even shorter stature ladies. What happens when you're grinding is a lot of times you're trying to orient your jaw in a way to like help breathing. So like, I know like some of the people like Stephen Lynn that the, he wrote a dental diet book and then like Sarah Hornsby, like your jaw, like you're trying to orient your jaw in a way that you're breathing better. And it usually means that you're breathing through your mouth too. So sometimes I think it's called bruxism is like the technical term for it. Mm. But if you're, if you're grinding your teeth, like that was the biggest indicator for me, like definitely teeth grinding. Cause I didn't grind as much when I taped, like, I don't really think I grind when I tape, but I grind mm. if I don't tape. So grinding can be another one to look out for too. Like if you just grind your teeth to a pulp, um, or you have a mouth guard, you might want to consider mouth breathing. Like I know that Dave or the Mark, sorry, not Dave, the Mark Burheny, one of those guys. Ask the dentist. I think it was him and I could be wrong. I could be wrong again. I feel like we like speculate a lot because this isn't like our total area of expertise in this episode, but I believe he has an article and even in it, he says he doesn't really recommend mouth guards anymore um, because people can still kind of grind even if they're in a mouth guard, if the like dysfunction is still present. So he kind of would rather work on like the breathing. If that's a part of why someone's grinding, he'd much rather work on the breathing and doing like more mouth tape type things, or again, like other kind of dental work or therapies to help kind of get the person breathing better. And then usually the, the grinding goes away. I don't think it's the only potential reason for grinding. Like I feel like I kind of get the sense that they like over, like if you're grinding, it's for sure mouth breathing. I don't necessarily know if that's always the case. Um, but it's something to consider too. Like, I don't necessarily think grinding is only due to stress either per se. Like it could be 
a disordered breathing pattern that's kind of stimulating more of the grinding. It's essentially what the myofunctional space says. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and again, like the solution is pretty easy. It can be weird at first yeah. to mouth tape. Feels It'll, like you're like I usually kidnapping tell yourself. People, huh? Feels like you're kidnapping yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I usually tell people give it a week and yeah. you might have a night or two where you're cursing my name or saying that I'm a weirdo and that this is the weirdest thing that ever anyone's recommended to you. But I am finding when I make the recommendation to do mouth taping, like when I feel like it's appropriate and necessary, I would say about 80% of the time people end up really liking it and thinking that it helps them. Probably the number one thing I hear is that it helps with mental clarity or they feel like they have more pep in their step when they right, mouth tape. Like energy. Yeah, like better energy. Um, mental clarity. Because you get more oxygen to just... your brain, oddly enough, right? when you breathe through your nose. So yeah, so something to look out for, certainly. Um, I think I only have yeah. one more nugget to throw out there. And then yeah, and then the boob has like... to peace out. <laughs> yes, I think it's about time to wrap it up. We live this. and die by the boob here at the IBS. We do. We all hail the, the boob. boob the on, one boob. On this podcast. Yeah, just the one, to be clear. Cece only likes the one. Right. Um, but mm-hmm. the other thing I was going to throw out there is I love my tongue scraper so much it there's just Mm. oh you know that feeling that you get with mouthwash where it's like everything is crisp and clean and sparkly and minty and beautiful it's like that but it doesn't hurt and there's no mintiness to it but oh my god there's nothing better than scraping all the shit off your tongue oh it's so good it is so good (laughs) So just throwing that out I love there. That. I've it's never like, used a tongue scraper. I should probably oh, invest in that. Get one. It's like $7. They're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, I only became a believer in the last couple of years and I started using it and I will never turn back. I pack that thing with me everywhere I go. But usually what I do personally, here's my little like oral care routine. You ready? Um, oh, shoot. I have one more thing to share before I, I teased you with my routine. One last thing to be a little bit careful of, I think it has less to do with gum health and microbiome health, but it is important for your enamel. Be really careful of acidic things. Uh, And because we know the people that we're talking to, we know darn well the people listening to this podcast, you're not drinking soda and doing that kind of stuff. But what you need to be careful of is lemon juice and damn apple cider vinegar all the time. So just be really right. careful and maybe, and like coffee as well, but just be careful if you eat or drink something really acidic, make sure that you rinse your mouth out a bit afterwards. Cause that can be really hard on your enamel. Um, yeah, that's a so, really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. Now I think my tidbits are done, so I'll share. Um, so at night I, I floss first, get all the debris out and I, I rinse out my mouth and kind of swish a bit to get any last little bits of crud. Then I brush with my electric toothbrush. And then after that is for me personally, at least that's when I scrape off the crap off my tongue. And then everything is sparkly and Mm. fresh and clean and delicious. It's wonderful. And then I pop in my little Invisalign thing. You have more of a plan than me. I'm just kind of a flosser and a brusher. I used to do like back in the day, I had a rotodent electric toothbrush, Mm -hmm. which I haven't used it as much lately. I feel like sometimes I run to the end of like the head that needs to be replaced. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of looking a little long in the tooth, pun intended, looking a little long in the tooth on the head of the electric toothbrush. So I'm like, oh, I need to get a new one and then I'll forget. And then it'll be like months will go by. And I'm like, well, I haven't used that electric toothbrush, but I would sometimes do that before I would do like my regular toothbrush. Hmm. Cause like with the rotodent, you're not really supposed to put a ton of toothpaste on it. Um, which is kind of strange. So again, like I'd like to have like the minty feel post that. I don't know. You kind of, I would kind of do like this thing where I kind of just do the fronts and the backs of the tooth, the teeth. And then I would actually brush a little bit more thoroughly with the toothbrush. So that was kind of the weird nuancey thing that I would do. But yeah, typically now I'm just doing, if I, floss and brush we're doing good over here um yeah 
at this point. I think. Uh, sometimes I can be a little lax with, like, I'll miss a day with flossing, but most of the time I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think that you're doing pretty good if you floss. And honestly, you'd be surprised how many adults don't floss in this day and age. Because I ask on my intake yeah. forms, I have some stuff about oral health and dental health on my intake paperwork. And I ask, do you floss? And you'd be surprised how many people say no. Or right. they'll say like once a week or once a month. And I'm like, oh, um, but you know, to be honest, nobody enjoys flossing, right? Like, it's just, it's kind of a thing that we all mildly dislike, but we do it anyway, because we know it's good for us. But um, we aren't going to do something like that unless we understand the value and we understand the reasoning Mm. for it. So sometimes it's just a matter of sharing with people that, oh, like your oral microbiome is the beginning of your gut microbiome. And if you swallow funky bacteria all day, some of that's going to shack up in your small intestine and further south. Oh, one last tidbit. If you have low stomach acid and dysbiosis in the mouth, oh boy, that's a recipe for, for cringe town USA, <laughs> right? Cause you're swallowing funky, mm. funky bacteria and then you're not killing them efficiently because you have no stomach acid. Ooh, uh, all of them yeah. are having a jamboree in your small bowel at that point. Um, but, mm. but anyhow, so I think just explaining to people that it really does matter particularly for gut health and inflammation type stuff. But your oral health is not separate from the rest of your health. I know like dentists go to dental school, doctors go to doctor, other doctor schools, and we kind of view oral health as being separate from the health of the rest of the body. But I promise you that is not the case. It is just as related to your bodily health as mental health. So we need to view it as such. So with that, with that being said, Let's let let's let the boob go so that Release Amy can get out of in. here and alleviate righty. And we will see you right back here yes. in the next episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast. Toodaloo.